Thank you for joining us in our midweek uh, look into the scriptures. We invite you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of Ephesians, uh, of course, in the New Testament. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with uh, God's Word, as others are. <clears throat> We're going to be looking specifically at chapter 6, but since this is the first of a series of, of lessons that I'm going to uh, bring in our midweek uh, get-together, I thought it'd be good to just kind of take a kind of an overview of the book of, of Ephesians and, and see what the book of, is about. Probably no other book uh, that I can think of anyway in the New Testament is as comprehensive as far as the living out of the Christian life is concerned as is the book of Ephesians. Uh, from chapter 1 through chapter 6, it's a relatively brief book. You can read it in just a few minutes. But what Paul does is he, he, he starts with salvation really from eternity past uh, to the present time, to the present living of our, our Christian life and how that is to be done. In chapter 1, he begins by, by going over and reminding us that each member of the Trinity has had a part in our salvation. Uh, in uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, he talks to us about the Father and the part that he played in our salvation. And what the, the, the Father did is that he planned it. He planned our salvation. In verses uh, 7 through 12, he talks about the Son, Jesus Christ, and what he did. And what, what the Son did was he, he secured our salvation. And... Uh, he he purchased it for you and for me. And then in in verses 13 and 14, it talks about the Holy Spirit and the fact that that he sealed our salvation. And what's interesting in that particular passage of Scripture there is that after each member of the uh, Trinity is spoken of, it tell, and what they did as far as our salvation is concerned, they the Apostle Paul explains to us why uh, they did it. Why did the Father plan it? Why did the Son secure it? Why does the Spirit seal it? And it's all for the same reason. They are united in their purpose in saving you and me. And that is essentially, I'll just combine the phrases, what it essentially says is, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which teaches us that the Lord saved you and me uh, not for us, but for himself. And that the purpose of our salvation uh, is not even getting us to heaven, although that is going to happen. The purpose of it is to the praise of the glory of his grace. It is to make us fit to, to first of all, to know the Lord, and secondly, to make him known. And that's an important thing for us to keep in mind as, as we go through this book. And then as, as you move on further through the book of Philippians, you will notice that there are, are three prayers that the Apostle Paul prays. In chapter 1, he, he prays a prayer for knowledge, that we might know the things that we need to know. In chapter 3, he talks about a, a prayer of being, and, and he, he talks about taking the things that we know and making them a part of our life. I can't get in very deeply into any of these things, but I just want you to know what the book of Ephesians is about. It's about your Christian life and my Christian life and how it is to be lived out. And then uh, beginning in chapter 6, he talks about doing. And re really, he goes back to, to chapter 4, and he talks about doing. 4, 5, and 6 is about doing. And, and it, the, the book is divided into three different sections. Chapters 1 and 2 is about where the believer sits. We sit with Christ in heavenly places. Chapters 3, 4, and 5 talk about how the believer is to walk in this world. And he says in chapter 4, we're to walk worthy and we are to walk holy. In chapter 5, we are to walk in love. We are to walk as light and we are to walk in wisdom. And then in chapter 6, where we're going to be today, he talks about uh, how the believer needs to stand in this world. So we have sitting with Christ, 
walking in the world and standing against the evils that surround us every day. And so the, the book of Ephesians is, is a very comprehensive book for you and me. And it's a book that we need to read. It's a book that we need to understand. And when you come to chapter 6, as Paul draws this book to a close, he talks about beginning in verse number 10 through verse number 20 in this, in this book. I want to read what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having uh, prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which, uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth and to make known what is uh, with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. What Paul describes here is a warfare that the believer is in, this believer who sits with Christ in heavenly places, this, this believer who, who walks in this world and who stands against the evil one in this world. That is the mission that Christ has set us on as believers in him. Warfare was not an uncommon thing in the Roman Empire, and I think that if you understand Roman history to any degree, you understand that. And so Paul, perhaps looking at a Roman soldier in his prison cell, begins to, to explain to these believers in the city of Ephesus what it means to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. And the, the, the belt symbolized preparedness or, or readiness for the battle that was ensuing and that they needed to be uh, ready uh, to, to battle. And what, what the belt was, basically, they wore a tunic, which, which was a very loose-fitting robe that the uh, the Roman people, whether they were in in the uh, army or whether they were citizens uh, in the empire, they they wore this loose uh, fitting tunic. And what they would do is they prepared to to travel or to go into battle or whatever else they had to do. They would take a belt and they would bring up their robe and they would tie the ends of the tunic and fasten it uh, to their waist because it freed their legs and that gave them greater mobility. And uh, the Bible refers to it as girding up their loins. That's what uh, the Bible terminology is. And, and the practical application for you and me is that in a spiritual sense, you and I also have to take up those things that can trip us up and can tangle us up in, in our lives. And we have to bring them under control and we have to strap them down, if you will, 
with the truth of God's word. You know, Paul talks in other places about believers who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Uh, there are many things that in this world that can distract us, that can trip us up, that can blind us, just like the Roman soldier. If a Roman soldier went into battle uh, without his tunic tied up or his loins being girt, then he was in extreme danger because he could get tripped up in his robe. He could, uh, the, the enemy in that hand-to-hand -hand combat could uh, grab the end of the robe and throw it over his face and he couldn't see what he was doing. And so this, to the Roman mind, was a very good illustration of what the truth does for you and me because there are so many things so many philosophies, so many uh, distractions that can happen in our world that it just trips us up and we become blinded to things that are of extreme danger to us. And the only hope that we have, the only thing given to us is the Word of God to kind of sort through all of the uh, the things that are coming at us, the philosophies that are being taught to us, that are being promoted. And so Paul says, look, in as, as you prepare for battle, you better have your loins girt about with truth. You better know the truth. And, and that truth for the believer is the word of God. The Greek word that is used here for truth was used in two ways. First of all, truth is content. You know, it's amazing to me how many how many believers have been saved for a number of years and still do not know the Word of God. They do not know its truths. They don't understand its principles. And the reason that many of them don't is because they're not in it themselves. And they don't have a, a real handle on the Word of God. And part of the problem, I believe, is in the pulpits. How many churches are there that claim to be Bible-believing, but they don't preach the Bible? They might tell good stories. They might, uh, you know, uh, make us feel good and all that sort of thing, but they don't get us into the Word of God to understand its truths and how those truths apply to our lives. And that's a tragic thing. Because Paul says, if you're going to go into battle, you've got to go into battle with the truth. And you've got to have a good understanding. You've got to know the Word of God in terms of its content. What is the content of this truth? And when we know that, then the Spirit of God can take those principles of truth, and when error is coming in at us, we are able to deflect that error, not, not because we know the error, but because we know the truth. And so one of the ways that this word was used in the Greek language was to speak of truth as content. But beyond the content of truth, there was another way it was used. And that, that is to use, uh, speak of truth in terms of commitment. And by, by what I mean by that is, is the individual's commitment to live out in their lives the principles of truth that they know. And that's an important thing for us. And it, it essentially has the idea of living out the truth without hypocrisy. Living out the truth as the truth and not as a sham. Uh, we're not just pretending. We are living out the truth that God has, has given to us in his word. What a treasure we have in, in knowing, in having the word of God. And to, to leave it sitting on our bedstand or to leave it on the coffee, coffee table or to leave it on the bookshelf, wherever it happens to be, and just letting it lie there day after day and week after week 
and never opening up the content of the Word of God and informing ourselves of God's eternal truth is not only a tragedy, it's sinful in the life of the believer. And then to take the truth that we know and not live it out in our lives in practical ways, to live honestly, to live graciously, to live compassionately, to live forcefully as far as, as being an ambassador for Christ and a representative of heaven on earth, in our family, among our friends and neighbors, is sinful. Uh, Peter says that it would be better not to have known the truth than to know it and not live it. You know, the Bible condemns us if it does not change us, if it doesn't transform us. And so as we begin this look at Ephesians chapter 6 and the, the whole armor of God, Paul starts us in preparation for this battle that we are in with our relationship to the truth of God's Word. If we're going to be God's people, then we need to be people of His book because this is how He instructs us on virtually every part of life that we, we are called upon to live. He instructs us how that is to be done. How do I represent Christ in a fallen world? Well, the only way I'm going to know how to do that is by looking into God's Word. And so this week, this day, as you listen to this brief broadcast and as we go out in, into the rest of this week and into the rest of our lives, Let's go, first of all, with a commitment to the truth, to know it in our minds, to believe it in our hearts, and to live it out in our lives. And when we do that, we will fulfill God's purpose in saving us because we will be living to the praise of of the glory of his grace. Let's pray. Father, how thankful we are that you have saved us, that you keep us, that you use us, and that you direct us in our lives through your word. And one day, we are going to be in your presence and we are going to serve you for all of eternity. But this is the starting place. This is where we begin. Help us in our lives to get to the starting line by learning your truth as content, by living it out in our lives and being committed to it. And then help us to run this race in a way that is worthy, in a way that is holy, in a way that reflects the light of the gospel, to run it out in wisdom, to run it in a way that brings honor and glory to you. Be with our people this week. We know this is a frustrating time, but this is where we're at right now. Help us to live out our lives as believers in Christ and, and to be good ambassadors for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for joining us today. God bless you the rest of this week. Run the race with patience and live your life with commitment to the truth of God's word.